So this is the section on thermochemistry, and this is also leading us into how we get these thermochemical values for the various compounds. And one of those ways is calorimetry, looking at bomb calorimetry. So next Monday's lab and Wednesday's lab is going to be just a really simple, it's probably even simpler than the freshman lab that y'all did on calorimetry, where you're just mixing hot and cold water. Okay? But you mix hot and cold water, and then you're going to actually calculate the calorimeter constant using that. So we've got some calculations associated with that uh, today. And then after that, we'll do bomb calorimetry, and we can solve for the delta H of uh, formation for a substance. And so you can kind of see where these values in these tables, delta H of formation values, come from. One of the ways that you can determine those is with bomb calorimetry. And so the thermochemistry is just focusing on the heat produced or required by chemical reactions, and then also phase changes. The chemical reaction that we write, say on the board or on our paper, that's going to be the system. And so then if, if heat is generated by that reaction, it's going to be lost to the surroundings, and so it'll be negative. And so that's where we get the exothermic. If it's delta H for that reaction is negative, then the heat was lost by the system and went into the surroundings. Uh, we're going to use standard temperature, uh, standard conditions in these thermochemical tables uh, are slightly different than, say, standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature and pressure is uh, what temperature? That's the thing that many people screw up. Uh, standard T STP for like gas laws uh, were based upon ice water because that was a real easy way to measure the volume of something uh, is put it in an ice bath so uh, ice water is the is zero C or 273.15 Kelvin so STP is 273.15 but standard thermodynamic conditions is 298 or room temperature okay so the standard conditions, you always have to make sure that you're using the correct standard conditions. Those little dots up there, or those little degree signs by the H and the U, those indicate standard conditions. And so these are the standard conditions, 298.15 Kelvin, and standard pressure is one bar. So this brings up the differences in, in pressure units. So uh, standard temperature and pressure, we're talking about a, a one atmosphere, and here we're talking about one bar. They're different by about 1%. In fact, it's 1.325%. <laughs> There's that number again. <laughs> okay, so a bar is, is 100,000 100, pascals. Okay, and one atmosphere is 101,325 pascals. Okay, so they're slightly different. All right, so, um, and then standard volume, begin, once you define the pressure and the temperature, then the volume would react to match those conditions. And so we don't have standard volumes, but we do have standard pressure and temperature. And one mole, typically we'll write things for one mole. Why are they different but so close? I don't know who decides on these standards. Okay. Yeah, it, I mean, it might be the International Union on Pure and Applied Chemistry, the IUPAC. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also, uh, you know, there's, I don't know. It's a great question. Um, not, not, not enough to say I'm stumped and get a sticker book. <laughs> but it's just a good question yeah. to, to say, how do we come to these standard conditions? And I don't know. I'd have to like, find a historian of science to okay. you know, pull that thread. So we have physical changes. This is, this is just a, you know, thinking about the world around you. And also, I want to point out the way some of these things are written. In Atkins, he puts the like vat for vaporation, vaporization right next to the delta. So it's showing you what kind of change took place. So delta vaporization of enthalpy instead of delta H of vaporization. And different books will write it different ways. This is Atkins' way of writing it. And, and in the notes, because I've used two different books, sometimes you'll see the vaporization after the H, and sometimes you'll see it before the H. And I apologize because it's just hard to keep everything perfectly consistent, especially when you switch books. So I want you to feel comfortable that those are the same thing. So if it's D VAT, Delta VAT H or Delta H VAT, those are the same thing. Okay. So in this case, we've got water going from liquid to gas. Uh, that's the system. It's not going to do that without taking in heat. And so then the, the sign on that Delta H is positive because it took in heat. And then the same thing, if we were to reverse that e equation, uh, gas to liquid would be exothermic. 
And I found that out yesterday. I was making some pasta and it was gaseous water coming out and I picked up the pot lid that landed on my hand and condensed to water. <laughs> and it was exothermic because my fingers were screaming. <laughs> so I didn't get it quite of a burn, but it hurt. And so, uh, so you've seen, I mean, you, you know this, it's melting uh, ice can be endothermic, but then uh, freezing water is exothermic. It sounds weird, freezing water is exothermic. You don't really feel the heat coming out of that, but you've got to take the heat out or it won't freeze. Okay, so that's why you're putting it in, in the freezer. And then sublimation, the simplest example of that, uh, if you're gonna think about water sublimation, it's in your freezer where you have uh, ice in the ice uh, machine or the ice tray, and then over quite a period of time, you have uh, ice crystals growing on other areas in the freezer. So it can go from gas, from solid to gas, and then gas back to solid. And these crystals are beautiful because they've grown really slowly. They've grown one molecule at a time. Now there's some confusion there too. If you're constantly opening and closing your fridge in Huntsville, the humid air goes in there. So that's not really sublimation. That's just going, I would say deposition. So uh, gaseous water is going into the freezer and landing on the ice and it's growing. And, and just going straight from gas to solid. So that'd be deposition. And so the, this, it'd be the delta H of sublimation, but that is the combination of fusion and vaporization. So you can see this simple diagram. If you plot everything on an energy scale, sublimation would be simply the, the addition of those two intermediate steps. And this points out essentially Hess's law that you can add these different reactions together and the resulting Delta H is going to be the sum of all of those intermediate steps. And so this is, we're going to talk about chemical uh, change and define Delta H of reaction. And so I want to point out the actual definition for standard reaction enthalpies. And you can see why, even though we calculate things with tables using these values, we might be off a little bit. And so I've underlined the words that make us off a little bit. <laughs> the pure unmixed reactants in their standard states become pure unmixed products in their standard states. <coughs> and so this does not account for the mixing. Excuse me. So there's not much mixing effect for gases, and there's not much mixing effect for liquids that are not coulombic. Right, but if you have ions, if you have ions, then this can be a uh, you know a substantial change. In fact, you can just put put salt in water, and there's no chemical reaction at all, but you can feel it warm up. Okay, and so what's going on is that water is forming these strong associations with that ion and solvating it, and because it's forming a favorable, essentially a bond, it's releasing that energy, and so you can see. That uh, some you know enthalpies of uh, mixing are, are exothermic. Some are endothermic. You're putting something in water and you're breaking up the uh, the favorable associations of water with water, and it has less opportunity to hydrogen bond. And so some mixing can be endothermic. So mixing is a, is a variable that's not taken into account by these standard reaction enthalpies. But most of the time, mixing effects are pretty small, uh, but not in ionic situations. And so we end up with this delta H of reaction you see here, which is just the products minus the reactants. We've already done this. We did this in the last lab. So you were doing your combustion enthalpies from Gaussian, and you did uh, products minus reactants. Were there any questions about that in terms of finding those? Did you find the, did you do the delta Gs as well in the lab and find the equilibrium constants? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you have any errors on your calculators or any equilibrium constants you could not calculate? because the delta G values were too high. I don't think so. You don't think so? Okay. They, they can sometimes. Calculators have gotten a lot better in terms of their abilities. Used to, if you tried to calculate uh, E to the positive 100, your calculator would, would die. Mm -hmm. I was testing it just this morning, and I could go up to 709 on my calculator. So E to the 709, I could get a result for, or 708. And, 709 would give an error, or 710 definitely would give an error. Interesting. So yeah, so it would go up, my, if you powers of 10, it goes to 
10 to the positive 308 to the negative 308. So that's the range of values. So that's quite a large range that my calculator on my phone can do. Okay, Hess's law, the standard enthalpy of an overall reaction is the sum of the standard enthalpies of the individual steps. So you can take a, a reactance and you want to know this delta H of reaction here. <clears throat> so this is unknown right here. And so you can say, let's take these reactants apart to their elements, because we know this. And let's build the products from the elements. We know that. And now we can take the difference, and we can get the delta H of reaction. So that's what we're doing. We're taking the sum of the delta H of reactants of the products and subtracting the reactants. And then whatever that result is, is our delta H of reaction. It's just what was shown previously, but on a graphical scale. Here's an example, the formation of ammonia. So let's say we didn't know this piece here. Okay. But we have tables with all of these other values. And so we can dissociate our nitrogen and our hydrogen. So we have N2 and H2. We take those apart to their atoms. And then we form one... NH bond, and then we form a second, and then we form a third, and now we have NH3. And so the, the sum of all of these minus that is going to give us our difference. Now in Gaussian, we have a different reference point. In Gaussian, the reference point is up there at separated nuclei and electrons. And so that's why all of our enthalpy values and Gibbs energy values in Gaussian were so big and so negative. Do you remember that? Every one of those that you looked up was hugely negative. And you added up all of those negative values for the products and subtracted all the negative values for the reactants. And sometimes you get a positive value, sometimes you get a negative value of that subtraction. But what it tells you then is this small difference down here at the bottom. Okay, down here. The reason being, I mean, this is, this is really convenient to have this as our reference point, okay? Because there aren't even any atoms at that reference point. So this could tell you the energy of every atom relative to every other atom. And this could tell you the, the relative energy of every molecule relative to the atoms or relative to other molecules. So it's a very convenient uh, reference point for energy at least for computation. Now, what's convenient for real life? Elements in their standard states. So, O2 gas at one atmosphere and one bar. Or no, one bar and, one, and 298. So, so that's, we'll just say that that has an enthalpy of formation of zero. Because it's an element, O2, it's at one bar, it's at room temperature, it's a gas. So gaseous oxygen at one bar and room temperature is going to have an enthalpy of formation of zero. That's our reference point for our thermodynamic tables. Okay. And so this is our, this is our definition. It's that, that substance, uh, the standard enthalpy of formation is that the substance reaction enthalpy for forming that compound from the elements in their reference states. And so pure elements like O2, for carbon, what do we use for carbon? That's kind of tricky, okay? Because we have diamond, we have graphite, and then the Nobel Prize, you know, fairly recently, maybe in the last 20 years, was for C60, C70, all these other pure forms of carbon that happen naturally. So these are natural forms of the elements at you know, room, temp no, yeah, room temperature and, and one bar. Okay. So which one of those is going to be the reference state? <clears throat> and it's going to be graphite for, for, uh, for carbon. Okay. And then you've got oxygen, O2 gas, uh, water. It's not a pure element. Okay. So water would not be a zero enthalpy for formation. Okay. You would form water from its elements if it's in their standard states, which would be hydrogen gas, one bar, uh, it's a gas at one bar and room temperature, and the same with oxygen. 
And so we take these enthalpies of formation, and what if this reaction is, is combustion? You know, we can find the enthalpy of formation for hexane using bomb calorimetry. And so here's our reaction. Here's hexane burning in oxygen, forming CO2 and water. We have this in a table, the delta H of formation of CO2 and water and oxygen is zero because it's an element in its standard state. And so we want to know what the enthalpy of formation is for uh, hexane. <clears throat> and so we measure this experiment to measure the enthalpy of combustion. And then this is what we, we solve for. And so this is how we would then find a value to enter into the table of these thermodynamic values, is we can use enthalpy of combustion using compounds that we know really well. We will characterize CO2. We know what its enthalpy of formation is. We know what water's enthalpy of formation is. And so we can use that values, those values that we know and then enter in new values into the table. So let's talk a bit about calorimetry. Let's think about next week's experiment of hot water and cold water. It's kind of an interesting thing. It's such a simple reaction. You're just, there's really no reaction. You're just taking hot water and cold water and mixing it together and seeing what happens to the temperature, okay? But thinking about energy, you can, you can make something so simple actually very interesting. We're boiling water in a hot pot like to make tea, okay? And so the system is generating heat and we're capturing that heat in water. And so we're bringing that heat over and dumping it into the calorimeter. And we have a mass of that hot water, so we're going to weigh that. And we're going to also weigh the mass of cold water. So in the end, we're going to have a total mass of water, which is the mass of the hot and the cold waters added together. And then this heat that was brought over from the system is, is captured in that hot water, and we're dumping it into the calorimeter. And what do you think is going to happen? Well, it's going to mix, right? The first law is that the heat from the system plus the heat from the surroundings add to zero because there's no energy created or destroyed. And so if we solve for the surroundings, it's going to be the equal magnitude but opposite sign of the system. Uh, that system, which is in our case really undefined, I mean it's the hot pot, that's where the heat came from. We're not really worried about what generated the heat. We just had the heat that was released by the system. It's going to be negative because it was released by the system. And our water and our calorimeter are the surroundings. And so the surroundings are the calorimeter parts. There's a little stir. There's a, the thermometer, metal jacket. There's the Dewar glass and so on. So they're going to take in some heat and the water is going to take in some heat. So we have the system. It's a negative value, and we're changing the sign on that negative value. So on the left, we have two, two minus signs. One's buried inside Q system. The other's on the outside. Okay. So that generates a positive value, which <coughs> matches the positive uh, heat going into the water and a positive heat going into the calorimeter. This is a huge exercise in making sure you never drop a negative. So let's color code this, uh, the, then solve for a Q cal. So the calorimeter, the heat going into the calorimeter is equal to the heat that was generated by the system. Again, that's a negative value and we're changing the sign on that, so now that's positive. Minus the heat that went into the water. <coughs> so this is a difference between a positive number in, on the left and a negative number on the right. And so this is what happens you know, mentally, that heat is delivered to the whole mass of water and the temperature of that water rises. That's another thing, too, that we can do thermodynamically is we can separate the process conceptually, even though in reality that water, the hot water brought the heat in and you dumped it in and, and the hot water was never cold, right? It was hot the whole time and the, water and the heat mixed. But what we can do conceptually is we can say the heat that the hot water is bringing, we're going to hold in our hand and we're going to mix in the, quote, hot water with the cold water, but we're going to say it's all cold. So we have a total body of cold water, and then we're going to throw the heat in. And then that whole body is going to rise up in temperature. Okay. So that's kind of what's represented on the left. We have the left 
blue block is the hot water and it has a temperature of th but we've kind of pulled that hot that heat out mentally mix the waters together now we have a pool of the water total and we dump the heat in and watch the temperature rise now it would be a weighted average of the temperature so if you had a, a 50 percent cold and 50 percent hot uh, and the hot let's say let's do zz numbers the hot was um, 100 degrees c and the cold was 50 degrees c and there was equal mixture then it would meet in the middle at 75 degrees c that would be the theoretical temperature be whatever the percent mass of hot and a percent mass of cold times their respective temperatures would give you that that average theoretical temperature but we've got a calorimeter we've got the glass of the doer we've got the sleeve of the thermometer we've got the stir stick so there's other places that heat can go so we never really reach the theoretical temperature we reach some final temperature that's close to that but it's not there and so that's what's shown the top line is the theoretical temperature which would just be the weighted average of the temperatures of the hot and cold uh, but the actual temperature is taking into account the, what actually went into the water. The missing heat is in the glass and the sleeve of the thermometer and the stir stick. So let's look at the equations. It's color coded. So Q system, this is the heat released from the system. When I say we, we grabbed the heat out of that hot water, okay, we need to take into account how much heat that was. It's the difference between the cold and hot temperatures. And it's the mass of the hot water. And then the, the heat capacity, the constant pressure uh, not, uh, yeah, the, for water. So the specific heat, I would say. And so it's the mass of hot water times that specific heat for water times the temperature change. And, and so when we grab the heat out of there, what's going on? The temperature of that, that water is going from T hot to T cold. OK, so that's that system that we've got. And when we release it in there, it's going to be a negative number because TC is less than TH. And so that's going to be a negative number because TC is less than TH. Now, the heat captured by the water is shown in this diagram. It was at the cold temperature, and now it's going to move up to the hot, to the, to the actual final temperature. And so that's TF minus TC. And this is the mass of the total amount of water times the heat, the specific heat for water. And then we can solve for this calorimeter constant. The glass also went from T cold to T final. And when I say glass, I also mean the stir stick and the sleeve of the thermometer and so on, all the parts of the calorimeter. It was at the T cold temperature and it rose up to the T final temperature. But we don't know what this C is. What's the heat capacity of the glass bits and the steel bits and all of that? It's, we don't know. So we don't have a per gram value there. We can get the joules per Kelvin, but we can't, you know, it's glass, it's metal, it's a, it's a mixture of different things. And so this is just going to be a constant that has joules per Kelvin. We change the Kelvin, we get the joules. Okay. And so this is the solving for this now. C cal is Q cal divided by the temperatures, and Q cal over here, Q cal is equal to these two pieces. So those pieces come over here. So everybody's cool with this step. Okay. <clears throat> and now let's put in Q cis from up here and H2O from up here. And so this is the s solution for our calorimeter constant. This would tell us how much heat is lost to the glass of the door, the stir stick, and the sleeve of the, of the um, thermometer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it's going to be really a fairly, I would say, fairly small number for our, those three items. Next week, let's see, week after next, we're going to have a big old stainless steel bomb in there. And we're going to have some leads, and we're going to have other parts to our calorimeter. So the count, calorimeter constant is going to be even larger when we do bomb calorimetry. But this would be a way that you solve for it. Yes? Would there any substance that if you poured it into itself that would actually get hotter? It's not like a mixture. A substance that you poured into itself? 
Yeah. I don't think there'd be any thermodynamic change. Yeah. Because <clears throat> if I, let's say, um, y'all were all associated with each other with favorable interactions, right? And I come in and interrupt that, um, I have to break some, but then you make interactions with me and it's a net zero effect. So the interactions you lost would be the same energy as the new interactions you gained. Yeah. You see? Yeah, so these mixing effects really uh, are, are the exchange of interactions. Am I, am I like hydrogen bonding in water? If I put oil in, into water, I have to break hydrogen bonds to do it. And water doesn't get anything for that exchange. And so as soon as the water can get past that oil molecule and make a hydrogen bond, the oil molecule can't get back and break it energetically. And so water actually just forces the oil out just by random motion. So you got an oil molecule, it finds itself in the middle of a pool of water, and as that water jostles around and it starts making hydrogen bonds, if that oil molecule ever found its way to the surface, then the water would make hydrogen bonds underneath it and the oil couldn't get back down in there because it would have to break those hydrogen bonds. And so that's why it separates. That's why oil would go to the surface or to the bottom if it was more dense. But as soon as it gets to the boundary, then it's just pushing water away from glass instead of water away from water. Or it's pushing water away from air instead of pushing water away from water. So it's a competition in these intermolecular attractions. And so a substance into itself, uh, if you were to label the atoms or molecules, it would still be a competition, but there'd be no energetic difference. Yeah, and so entropy would drive that interaction. So, um, so this will be solving for the calorimeter constant, and which we will do three times each next week. So you can work with pairs, but you'll do six runs. You're just mixing water into the calorimeter and writing, uh, measuring the, the data with the little Raspberry Pi system that we have. Okay. And so that way, when you do it three times, you'll be able to calculate your average calorimeter constant and the standard deviation, and you'll be able to analyze it. Um, to see if it depends upon the total amount of water or whatever. So once we know the calorimeter constant, then we can use it to, um, to do unknown things. So here we have a system inside of our water bath, and that system generates a burst of energy uh, released as heat, and the temperature changes. How do we know what happened in terms of thermodynamically with the system? So this would be bomb calorimetry. The first law stuff is the same, but the thing that's, that's different, so this stuff hasn't changed, but the thing that's different now, if we're doing combustions, so we do a combustion in this little bomb, it releases heat, and it's the number of moles of fuel times the combustion enthalpy for that fuel. And so this, um, if we know the, the uh, substance that we're burning, we would know this value, this combustion enthalpy. And so this, uh, this value, the enthalpies of combustion, are negative for our fuels you know, that <clears throat> spontaneously burn in oxygen. And so that's going to be a negative Q system. It's going to generate heat. So heat's going to leave, energy's going to leave the system. And so for, for our bomb calorimetry, we'll use a standard benzoic acid tablet. So we weigh it out so we have an accurate amount of number of moles. And then we will burn that in pure oxygen. And that will generate a known amount of heat, and we can use that to calculate our calorimeter constant. So these equations, water and all, haven't changed at all. And so we'll solve for that calorimeter constant using benzoic acid. And once we have that, then, uh, then we can use that calorimeter constant to solve for unknown amounts of heat. So when Q system is unknown, the surroundings are water and a calorimeter constant, uh, the calorimeter parts. And then we have the same first law stuff, but now we have the Q system generating heat into the water and heat into the calorimeter. And since we know this calorimeter, then we can, uh, calorimeter constant, we can pull it over here. So when you do your unknowns, you measure out the mass of water and you calculate this piece and then you have your calorimeter constant for that piece, and then you look at the temperature change. And so that'll tell you how much heat was generated by your unknown. 
So you'll do, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about having the group, like the whole class work together on Monday and on Wednesday and to have, uh, you know, teams do three runs. So teams of two people doing three runs each. Okay. And you can do uh, a benzoic acid and an unknown twice, or you can have, you know, three people or four people in the lab determine the calorimeter constant and the other people do unknowns. We can work as a group to kind of see. So we need at least three determinations of the calorimeter constant. And then each group will be measuring three runs. Okay, so then you'll have uh, the ability to do some statistics on your results. Okay. Notice that the calorimeter constant, uh, we're calling it a constant. It might depend a little bit on the volume of water, but the major effect is going to be the mass of water that you put into the calorimeter. So if you put in 400 grams of water and you put in 450, uh, that's going to be the major effect. The only difference is going to be the difference that 50 mils has on touching the walls of that door. And so that's just a small little rim of glass that's different in the two situations. So the calorimeter constant really would depend upon, like for super precise work, the depth of the water. Okay, because you're touching a little bit different amount of glass. But, but in general, the main effect is the amount of water you put in there. And then there's small adjustment for the calorimeter constant. For your hot and cold water, this comes out to be about, this, this piece is about 10% adjustment. So it's enough to throw your values off 10%, but it's only 10%. You know, so it's, it's not 80%. So it's just it's a good idea to, to know the scale of things. So all of these little figures with the, with the, all of these last three figures were new. So I'll put these up so that you can go through them again on your own. Let's talk now about standard enthalpies of formation. And here's several compounds, some nitrogenous compounds. Notice that you see differences um, between, like the reactions, uh, like here's water. That's a good one to use, sort of to scale the table. And so this would be the amount of joules, and this is kilojoules per mole up here. So that's how many kilojoules you get from forming a mole of liquid water. Quite a bit, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, sodium chloride. So you take sodium metal, which is a pure element in its standard state, in in a solid, and chlorine, which is a gas at room temperature in one bar, and you mix them in a beaker. Now you may not see much of a reaction because of surface area, but if you scratch the surface and get rid of the the oxide layer that's protecting the sodium, it's going to go. And you'll see all kinds of reaction because it's generating uh, 400 kilojoules per mole of sodium chloride. So it's very reactive and very uh, exothermic. But I mean, explosive? Well, if it's contained, yeah, yeah, it could generate enough heat to burst the container, which is really all an explosive is. Yeah, interesting. Is you take something really exothermic and put it in a confined spot, and they could it could pop. Okay. Um, Aluminum oxide is even more. So, so let's look at some of these react, uh, reaction enthalpies. So here's hydrazine mixing with oxygen. And so let's just practice calculating the uh, enthalpy of reaction. So we, we've got products. So we have N2 and two waters. So this is going to be 2 times the negative 2, what was it, 2... Um, 85 to 86. This is zero. Okay. These are the products, so they're positive. Okay. Minus zero for the O2. And then minus whatever this is, because it's a reactant. Let's go back. N2H4 is a plus 50. Plus 51. So 51. And you got to take into account the number of moles. This is one place where people mess up, is there's two moles of water. The other place is when they have a negative sign and it's a negative sign on the reactants, they only use one of the negative signs and then they screw that up too. So adding these things together, we end up with delta H of reaction as negative 622. 
because this is negative, so that's about 400, and then we're subtracting even more. Okay. So very exothermic. <clears throat> it's going to generate nitrogen gas, and actually, before the water can condense, you know, it's going to be propelling with that hot gas that comes out. But this would be then the amount of energy you would get after the gas condenses back to water. Okay. So this is the reaction that happens in rockets? One of the ones that could happen. So you could put hydrazine in and you could have oxygen, an oxygen tank and mix them. And if you take them and you mix them, they're gonna you know, explode and the forces are gonna go in all directions, right? But what if this right here is the focal point of a parabola? What does the parabola do? It takes all of those rays and shoots them down in a parallel direction. So that's why rocket motors are shaped the way they are. So that, that parab parabolic shape, that cone-looking shape, is turning the force of the explosion it's going out in all directions. If you could get it to mix at exactly the focal point, it'd be super efficient. And it would push down, and then the force of the rocket would be going up. You know? And so you have propulsion. And so now you can say, hey, PCHEM, it is rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But liquid, uh, but uh, you know, oxygen, if you want a lot of oxygen, you're going to liquefy it. And so um, gaseous oxidants or even liquid oxygen are a real pain. Uh, because one, they're super reactant, and two, uh, you've got a lot of pressure if you've got a liquid oxygen system. If you want to reduce the pressure, then you need to cryogenically cool it. So then you've got cryogenics, which adds weight. And so let's try to use an oxidation source that's not a gas. And so we can use hydrogen peroxide. So you might think, wow, hydrogen peroxide is not that oxidative. You know, you've got some maybe in your bathroom cabinet. Oh. But if you look at the bottle, it's only 3%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> only 3% and it bubbles like that. You know, 100% oh, hydrogen peroxide is super dangerous because it's, it's, it's good for rocket fuel. So if we took this, um, we've got now plus 4 times the 286, 0 here. Negative okay, negative 2 times, and let's go back to our little... Um, thing. So H2O2 is negative 187. So we actually have to tear this molecule apart and so that that's actually hurting us a little bit. Negative 2, um, no, negative 187. Negative 188. Okay, so 188. And we, we want a more negative number and so this, when I say that hurts us, is we've got a, a reactant that has to be torn apart. Okay, so we've got a, a positive number here, but then we're going to have the negative 51 here. Where our really big gain comes is generating four moles of water. And so that gives us most of our, our punch, and that's negative 818. So now, not only do we not have to worry about cryogenics, high-pressure tanks for the gaseous reactant, uh, we're getting more joules of energy using hydrogen peroxide. We have to worry about how we handle it, but it's still a liquid. We can put it in a, in a composite tank or a stainless steel tank and be okay. Okay, a glass-lined stainless steel tank. So liquid-liquid fuels work well, but what about space? It'd be nice if we just went to space and we could run rockets without having an oxidant. Fewer containers, you know, and so we could just take hydrazine. It has a positive enthalpy of formation, which means thermodynamically it's uphill from its elements. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all we got to do is tickle it a little bit and it'll go back to its elements mm -hmm. <laughs> and release the energy. So here we have zero and zero and a negative 51. Oops. Why won't I write? Okay. And so this is going to be, again, negative 51 kilojoules per mole. And how do we tickle it? Well, we can put it on a hot wire or some kind of little sparker. And so we have liquid hydrazine. We have a little solenoid pump that spits some of it out, and it hits a hot wire and decomposes into its elements. And those gases come shooting out, and if we direct them in a certain direction, then, then they propel. 
There's a, I mean, is this sufficient? Well, you tell me. Let's look at a video. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's pretty sure we're working against anything. Yeah, so exactly. So it makes sense to be such a little. Yeah. Excellent to make.